Welcome to the Deadly Sins of uh, BDD Scenarios. My name is uh, Mark Wintringham. I've been a software tester for about 10 years and alongside that um, I teach and talk on test automation practices and tools which has um, kind of brought me into sort of the area of uh, scenarios in BDD which uh, we're going to talk about today. Um, some of the things that uh, I talk about here, I've blogged on my website on MW Test Consultancy. Um, and you can get in touch with me at uh, 2 -bit Tester on Twitter or via LinkedIn. I also co-run the Software Testing Clinic, uh, which is currently based in London. Um, what we do is we offer free training events for people who are looking to get into software testing or are juniors. As software testers as well as having um, uh, options for more senior testers to come along and act as mentors to the juniors and you know give senior testers um, the sort of a place to sort of improve their own coaching and mentoring skills so as I say I've been a tester now for 10 years and I was sort of first exposed to scenarios I'd say about six years ago um, I was sort of shown them and told that um, to use these scenarios um, they had to be used in sort of conjunction with a thing called behavior driven development um, and then along with that that's actually an evolution of a uh, different tool called um, acceptance test driven design and they're sort of kind of similar and the acceptance test driven design was all about um, acceptance criteria and acceptance tests and I found as I sort of started getting into all of this and started working with it that um, I found it very confusing, if I'm honest. And because I had that confusion, um, that led to problems and mistakes and traps that I fell into. Now, I, I don't think I'm the only tester or the only team that's fallen into these sort of traps. Um, and I think one of the reasons why we all do it, like I say, is, is, is that confusion. So this talk is about sort of hoping to sort of clear some of those confusions about how we're supposed to use scenarios um, within a BDD context. Um, but rather than sort of talking about tools and processes and how they should be applied, I'm going to present to you a series of sins that I myself have committed um, and it's likely that maybe uh, you have. Um, and I want you to use these sins as a heuristic to evaluate your current testing and team activities. Ask yourself, am I falling into these traps? Am I committing these sins? So that you can you know, spend time as a team to um, work and improve. So let's start with uh, sin one. And I felt that um, since we're talking about scenarios, why not define the scenarios as... Um, why not define the sins of scenarios even? So sin one is uh, given I have a business requirement to test. When I write multiple scenarios to exhaustively test the requirement, then I am testing the requirement effectively. And what I mean by this is using scenarios as test cases. So I see a lot of testers and I myself, when I first started using scenarios, um, treat them as a sort of a testing artifact, a testing output, you know, sitting by myself, not engaged with the rest of the team, sort of generating these these scenarios to be used as a means to sort of validate um, features as they come through. So some examples of this, um, this is kind of based on one of the one of the first projects I got involved in um, when I was using scenarios. I immediately sort of was gravitated towards the use of scenario outlines. And what I would do is I would um, I'd set up a scenario uh, quite quite light, but then I would fill it with lots of different examples. And the thing with these examples were, were that they weren't really actually demonstrating business value. They were just different types of data, different types of test ideas that I came up, came up with. And this is sort of a cut down version of it. Like the first first one I created, um, I wish I could find it, but unfortunately lost it. It had something like 
10 columns and 30 rows of examples it took ages to run and it was all sort of through an automated system which um, we'll touch on later and then you come across the sort of scenarios which are very granular based steps lots of given and 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 ands whens and and ands then and a few more ands and the interesting thing is that these these scenarios are very similar to test cases in that they're, like I say, very granular, very explicit, talking about an actual event that the, that the person interacting with the system has to trigger. The thing being is that you're sort of missing the, um, you know, the expected outcomes and the recorded outcomes um, in, a, in a table format. So when I think about um, using scenarios as test cases and when I hear testers talking about scenarios being a sort of a means to validate the system or you know referring to um, referring to scenarios and saying I've written the BDDs um, I'm reminded that basically we're making the same mistakes as we were before as testers we feel that maybe that uh, we're actually progressing. We're trying something new because test cases aren't quite working. So we're going to try this this shiny thing called scenarios, and we're going to write them in business language, and that's going to make them more of effect more effective. But really, actually, um, the syntax might be changing. It, it might be like a new veneer, but it's the same problems sit underneath. It's still a test case, and that means that you know you're running into the same problems with maintaining all these scripts. Um, in terms of writing new ones, keeping the other ones up to date, um, trying to execute them. They bias how you might do your regression um, testing because you feel like you need to execute them all the time, um, which leads to sort of long sort of cycles with them um, testing. And essentially all the sort of issues that you have with test cases that, like I say, manifest again, Whereas versus you might be wanting to consider something more like a, a modern testing approach, such as exploratory testing. So how do we atone for this? Well, yeah, stop using scenarios as test scripts. Stop thinking about them as a test output. Um, they are a team output. The team is responsible for them because they are there to help discover requirements and discuss requirements. So start getting your team involved in developing scenarios. Start looking at um, approaches such as um, Three Amigos, getting a tester, a developer, and someone from business involved, get them discussing um, what's going on, what, what's the requirements, what's the value, and then record scenarios that kind of help solidify that, that agreement that you have within your team. And be wary of tools. Um, I know for myself, and again, I've seen it in um, other testers, is that we easily get sort of seduced by the tools um, and start wanting to use things like Cucumber or Specflow, when really what we want to be thinking about is where, where are we at, as a team? Um, BDD is about communication, and if we're not communicating uh, very well before we use a tool, then using the tool afterwards isn't going to improve things. Think about your problems first, then think about how you need to change change those problems, and fix them, and then choose a tool that might be able to support you. So moving to SIN 2, given I have a business requirement to specify, when I document, document them using scenarios, then I'm specifying the requirements effectively. The issue here now is documenting acceptance criteria scenarios. So you've taken that sort of that first step and you're now working as a team and you're collaborating on uh, writing scenarios. Um, but but they're hard. S writing scenarios are hard. Um, and, and one of the confusions I found myself in was this situation of sort of when was when was enough? When were we writing too few scenarios versus too many? So, for example, I was working on a project where we were collaborating. We would um, have a three amigo session before we would start um, development. 
then we'd have like like say like we'd have like a feature such as like a, a twitter widget and we'd sort of say the ba would go oh i want to oh, i want a twitter widget and we go okay cool. so what do you need for that oh well, we need a link okay so we'll write a scenario that says if you click on that link a little update widget is shown and then we need another scenario that sort of says well we've got text fields and we've got submit button in there and then we've got some other things going on we, you know less than 140 characters more than 140 characters and what we end up doing is generating scenarios for each of these sort of rules that we're setting in place these acceptance criteria now the issue that we find with this is that it starts generating a lot of noise and that becomes a problem in two ways the first being is that the you know you're generating all these these different scenarios that um you actually start losing sight of what the value is of the feature that you're creating um, and also you're losing sight of the uh, the rules that you're setting in place the two get sort of merged together so for example you know one of those scenarios that's sort of saying there needs to be a link um, that's not really describing the value but at the same point it's adding a lot of verbosity to describing something that should be maybe in one line. Now, the second issue is that it generates um, a lot of noise in terms of knowing when to stop. So what would happen for us um, on the project that I was on was that we would find ourselves missing bits and pieces. So we'd either go too far or we'd have gaps in um, what we were covering. So we'd end up in this situation i was very lucky to be pairing with developers as we were developing and we'd sort of uh we were using sort of tdd practice and we'd start writing some tests and um we sort of say oh hang on um we have we, we've got this edge case for this scenario ah we need to create a new scenario for this requirement that covers this edge case and then that edge case would have edge cases and we'd create scenarios for those and before we knew it, we were sort of falling into scope creep. We were expanding the story because we didn't really know where the, the where the sort of the strict confines of the feature were. And this was a problem because it meant stories got stuck in um, sprint for a long time as we kept working on them again and again. And also, um, we found ourselves sort of drifting back towards sin one. You start generating so many scenarios for things like edge cases that might not necessarily be business related edge cases, but technical edge cases. Um, we're just writing tests again. We're just writing test cases in scenarios. So how do we atone for this? Well, recently I've um, adopted um, the example mapping approach that Matt Wine came up with at the end of um, 2015. Um, I was introduced to this about a year ago. And the idea is that uh, example mapping adds a bit of structure to your collaborative sessions, but not enough that not so much that uh, it stifles the conversation. So we start with our story, which is our as a user, I want something to happen so that I have value. And then we set out our rules and these are our acceptance criteria and we put them on a post it note each or whatever you want to use. And you sort of set out each rule. So things like there must be a link to click, there must be um, a text box and a submit field maybe, or there might be you know things talking about it has to be over 140 characters. So those are the sort of defined rules. Then below that we can use scenarios as examples to illustrate how we expect the rules to work. And generating those examples helps generate questions. So there might be things that we've missed. There might be things that uh, we feel um, need to be developed in a different story. So it helps with uh, defining our scope. And it also um, means that those questions are tracked for the future. So we can either resolve them in that session or we create new stories for the future. But it helps everyone know when to stop. So we end up with a situation where we have a scenario now that's got acceptance criteria written at the top. So we, this is sort of an example based on the uh, four scenarios at the start of this scene. But here we've sort of clearly dictating what the rules are. And now the scenarios are just describing how we'd expect the end user to use it, what value they're getting, what the sort of the key 
uh, things that we're trying to sort of get across as a business. So let's move to sin three, which is my uh, favorite of all the sins. Given I have a number of example scenarios, when I automate them all, then I've automated my business requirement coverage. Or automated scenarios as acceptance tests equal awesome automation. So what I'm talking about here is the trap of having an automation strategy that's solely based on automating scenarios and thinking that's enough to validate your system and to share information about what's going on with your system. So what's the issue with this? Well, let's take a look at imperative and declarative scenarios. So we have imperative, which are lots of steps, very granular, very explicit, also known as sort of web steps, and the fact that it's focusing on actions. And then we have declarative, uh, which is more high level, more abstract, focused on user value rather than actions. And when we talk about writing these scenarios, we are keen to write declarative scenarios because what they do is that that abstract sort of nature of them allows us to think about different questions. It allows us to think about different things beyond the mere sort of act of carrying those steps out. So they're an excellent tool uh, within collaboration. Now, the issue is, is that as soon as that becomes automated, a lot of that nuance, a lot of that implicit information that's being discussed about, that's being collaborated on, um, gets lost. Because if you think about what happens when you automate a scenario, you know, even if it's a declarative one, we set up some step definitions, and then within that, we're calling an API, probably something like WebDriver, Selenium WebDriver, to execute a bunch of actions on a browser. It's, and it's it's triggering those actions imperatively. So although you still have a sort of abstract declarative scenario, the execution uh, is imperative. Unlike when you're reading it, you're thinking about it in a declarative way, you're thinking about it in an abstract way. So it, as scenarios become automated, the scope of what they're actually focusing on and what information and what they're validating becomes greatly reduced. So let me give you a sort of an analogy of this. Uh, last year, as I was preparing this talk, I was at a peer conference in New York and we were discussing uh, BDD. And we were talking about how um, I, I was sort of saying how I don't feel that uh, BDD is a testing tool. It is a collaborative tool on process that's used to sort of specify requirements to which um, I was sort of said, well, that's all well and good with scenarios, but, you know, they can't specify everything. For example, you can't specify love, you know, within within words. And, and that's true. That's absolutely true. But, but it got me thinking. If I thought that what can happen is if, if my wife sort of is sitting with me and I say, you know, darling, show, tell me what I need to do to show you that I love you. And she might give me some examples. She might give me some scenarios that I can execute. So she would say, buy me flowers on a regular basis. Um, call me up at work or send me an email saying you're thinking about me or just check in with me let me know like you know how you are and ask me how my day is now what she's telling me there you know there are some actions that i can execute but if i execute them personally you know there's there's a lot of implicit things going on there in terms of you know the the act of giving a gift the act of taking time out um or financial t you know paying money to to buy a gift um, the fact that I'm actually you know she knows that I'm thinking about her all those things will mean something to her now what happens if I was to uh, set up a direct debit and have those uh, those flowers delivered on a regular basis and I set a cron job up that would email her with sort of randomized emails she's not going to be very happy about that and that's because, again, a lot of 
what makes that act um, something meaningful is completely lost because you're just boiling it down to its um, its base actions. Now, if we go back to uh, sort of automation, the problem with this is that it gives us an illusion of coverage. What we think when we read a scenario versus what is actually being um, verified in test automation can be two very different things. So we can have this belief that, you know, the idea of that if we can automate all of our scenarios, that ca that's covering all the things that we're thinking of about the application is, is simply false. And it's actually doing sort of damage to the sort of the identity of a software tester. Because the idea is, is that, you know, if we can we can just simply automate these scenarios, then we don't need testers because that's covering all our bases. Which as a software tester, you know, I feel that's very dangerous. There's a model by uh, Richard Bradshaw, friendly tester, which he calls the failed automation regression testing model, which is, which I think sort of, again, highlights this problem. And what he's talking about is the idea of your automation being the green in the middle, and that's always catching up with our knowledge. We know more than what we're automating. Um, and we're constantly trying to automate some of that. And then our knowledge is always trying to catch up with the system because we don't know everything about the system. And whilst things like BDD, collaboration, scenarios can help um, solidify that knowledge, you know, there's still going to be things that go on in the system that we're, we're not going to, you know, that are going to manifest that we're not quite expecting. And then you can see we've got sort of these blue and orange boxes, which are our gaps in our knowledge and our gaps in our testing. Now we're creating gaps in our testing if we're assuming that our automation covers the same basis as knowledge. So how do we atone for this? Well, first of all, decouple your automation strategy from your scenarios. I'm not saying don't automate scenarios, but don't base everything purely on uh, writing a bunch of scenarios and automating them. That that won't work. Think about what your problems are first. So identify your risks. Think about what it is that you want from your automation. Do you want to get um, feedback quickly? Um, do you want it to set, inf set data up easily for you? Then think about what's the right tool for the job. It may be that automating a few scenarios is the right tool, but at least you have confidence. You have you have something that you can actually link it to and say, this is why I'm using this tool, rather than just sort of thinking, well, this is, you know, this is the way the market is going, or this is my, you know, we like the look of this tool, so we're just going to use that. And finally, put the human back in the center of your automation. Test automation isn't going to replace a tester. Um, you can use a blend of um, sort of sapient testing um, and automation, but your automation should always be about supporting um, that tester. So let's recap. We help deliver what the business wants as a team by using scenarios to enable discussion and collaboration, not by using scenarios and examples as test scripts, using scenarios as acceptance criteria, or basing your automation on scenarios alone. So all that's left is me to say thank you for um, listening to me. Uh, as I say, you can get in touch with me if you have any questions on 2-Bit Tester or on LinkedIn. And all that's left is for me to say thank you to Hindsight Software. Thanks. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, that was uh, very interesting. Uh, please do keep your questions coming in, because um, we will follow up with a blog post with answers to these questions, even if we don't get time. Um, so one of the question we've had through is, so what do you do when you don't have test cases for your project? It depends on the maturity of the project um, and how much yeah, it depends on the maturity of the project in terms of um, sort of what level of 
quality the code base is in. So you know, if, if there is, there's a need for regression checking to sort of see, so for me, regression checking, regression testing is about change detection. And if the concern is, is that if we don't have any sort of test cases in place um, in, a, in a sense because we're try, trying to capture these changes so that we know that if these changes occur that we can fix them before we deliver them, then um, what I would do is I would develop an automation strategy that maybe targets those areas to sort of reveal the information. So um, when I look at legacy applications, for example, I'll look at how the whole thing is hung together and think about how I can sort of envelop certain aspects of that application um, with um, automated checks. So um, I, I do a lot of sort of stuff around sort of API testing and API automation. So um, I worked on a product once where we had test cases for our little bits and pieces that we were extending for this very large application. Um, but what we did was we just surrounded it with a bunch of um, automated checks that would just tell me if something failed or not. The fact is they, they were delivering value to me because they they go red if something went wrong. What I didn't need to do was then generate a bunch of scenarios um, up front um, and try and sort of understand how things work on a sort of business level before then adding automation in. I think if you're in a sort of newer project or if you're in a project where you know, code changes are less risky, then um, things like uh, exploratory testing, um, session-based test management are very effective tools um, for testing. Um, they, can, they can allow a tester to get started testing straight away rather than having to worry about sort of generating a bunch of test cases. And all that time that you would have spent generating those test cases, you're actually having the tester test uh, the product. And you can have a blend of the two as well. So um, I'm a test lead at the moment, so I'm, I'm responsible for putting together our strategy. And I have an aspect where there's exploratory testing for the new things, and then automated checking um, on various different levels of the stack that are not necessarily tied into scenarios to give me information about what's going on um, to, the, to the rest of the product. Mark. Um, Mark actually mentioned about API testing. Uh, Mark actually does run a very good uh, workshop on API testing that's been very popular at conferences. So if you do get a chance to see that at a conference, I do highly recommend it. I've been on it myself. Okay, so we've actually got a follow-up question. Uh, you might have already covered some of it uh, in your previous answer because of the level of superb detail. Um, so you have your BDD scenarios that cover the acceptance criteria then, the criteria, then do you keep a repository or other grouping of manual test cases or do exploratory testing? So normally, uh, again, this is sort of context dependent in um, how, much, how much information do I need to report to people. Um, so I don't, I don't do, I don't use test cases. Um, I'm sort of quite one of those sort of, staunch believers that test cases are sort of um, a thing of the past. Um, but what I would do with exploratory testing um, is I would save um, testing notes um, or mind maps to, um, to my exploratory sessions. And then I would use um, the process of session-based test management, which is worth uh, checking out, which was um, created by James and John Bark. Um, but the idea is is that we can basically we generate what is known as charters, and charters um, are tied into perceived risks that we think might cause problems, or um, that you know the things that we need to find more information out to to determine whether this is a risk or not. So those charters are tied into those risks, and then those charters get executed as um, sessions. Um, and they're time boxed as well. So what I can do with that is because they're time boxed, I can say how many I've done, how many I haven't done. Um, I can say how many went successfully, how many didn't in terms of was my testing blocked, was it not? Um, I can output bugs from that and that can go somewhere else into a sort of bug repository. Um, the point being is that there's still a way to sort of tracked, tracked, track um, testing effort um, that doesn't necessarily have to be sort of based upon um, test cases. 
Mark. Um, that's all we all the time we have for for the QA session. So I'd like to thank you again, Mark, for taking uh, spending your evening uh, delivering this webinar. Uh, if you want to follow Mark on Twitter, is he's two bit tester, and he has a blog uh, nwt test well nw testconsultancy.co.uk. Um, if you do have any further questions, just contact us on the Hindsight um, support portal and we'll try pass them on or answer them ourselves. So I'd like to thank Mark again and have a everybody have a great day.